Leon Telesur, the news source from South America and the Caribbean. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Saini Green. Costa Rica has voted decisively in favor of a progressive president. They have voted in Carlos Alvarado Casada of the Citizens Action Party. Casada beat out Alvarado Munoz in Sunday's vote by a much larger margin than anyone had expected. This election was dominated by the debate over same-sex marriages. Alvarado Casada will be Costa Rica's next president. He took almost 61% of the vote, defying polls that showed him locked in a dead heat with Alvarado Munoz. Today the world looks to Costa Rica, and Costa Rica once again sends out a beautiful democratic message. Well done, Costa Rica. Celebrations rang out in the streets of the capital as supporters of the center-left candidate cheered the results. Many say the election of the former Labour Minister brings continuity in office. I think we can say that at this moment Costa Rica is full of love. Costa Rica was caught up with hate, not just with someone, but with a party. Today, love wins. And we have to show this to the world. Costa Rica is love. I'm extremely happy for Costa Rica. It was a completely unexpected result, but it confirms the country's fate. A very different ending to this story for rival Alvarado Munoz. The 43-year-old former TV journalist conceded quickly, leaving some of his supporters in tears. Munoz has vowed to restore what he calls traditional values. He wants to prevent gay marriage and to restrict women's access to abortions. Carlos Alvarado Quesada will take the reins on May 8th. The former minister will be sworn in for a four-year term. At just 38 years old, he will be the youngest president in the modern history of Costa Rica. And shortly after winning the vote, he spoke to the people of Costa Rica and vowed that he will work with them to move the country forward. Costa Ricenses, fellow Costa Ricans. We celebrate a democratic transition on May the 8th. The shift in power will be austere, just as our government will be. What Costa Rica needs is a government that works hard for the country. I also would like to add that this will not be Carlos Alvarado's government or the PAC government. Today, I call for a national government. Today, I call for the government of the bicentenary. So we move Costa Rica forward as the Republic commemorates its 200 years. We celebrate our path to development. And serving alongside Carlos Alvarado Casada will be Vice President-elect Epsi Campbell Barr. She will be the first black woman in this position in Costa Rica. Barr is a founding member of the ruling Citizen Action Party, an economist and an author. In, in an interview, she said it would be her responsibility to represent people of African descent, as well as all women and men in the country. For more results on cost, for more on the results in Costa Rica, we join line from San Jose by the independent journalist Gustavo Fuchs. Hello, Gustavo. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's start with the vice president, Epsi Campbell Barr, Costa Rica's first black vice president. How are people reacting to her election? Uh, well, this is definitely his. Historic, uh, not only because of the conditions in which the election took place, but also because she would be the first um, African American woman to become uh, the vice president in in Latin America. It's it's really um, a breaking point in our history. Not only because of her election, but because of the whole uh, debate uh, regarding human rights and many of the of the elements that were in at, at stake in these elections during these elections was uh, national. 
national identity. So uh, the fact that an African American woman is uh, today the vice presidential, well, the vice president uh, virtually, uh, is is very very significant, and it tells you a lot about what Costa Ricans uh, what Costa Ricans think of themselves and how they are still uh, building their own national identity. So, Gustavo, the polls were really wrong in these elections. How much of a surprise is the victory of um, Carlos Alvarado um, Quesada? Well, it, it was a very surprising victory because of the margin. Like, the, the, there were, like, it was 20, 20 percent uh, between both candidates. Uh, most of the polls were already predicting the same margin uh, in favor of uh, Mauricio Alvarado, but the most academic polls, the ones uh, that were carried out by the University of Costa Rica and the National University, uh, they were very different. They showed a diff different uh, scenario where uh, the University of Costa Rica placed both candidates at a tie, and the National University had actually predicted the victory of Carlos Alvarado. So basically there was a division between uh, commercial uh, opinion poll companies or pollsters and the more academic studies that were carried out during the election. Um, it definitely it definitely shows uh, a particular uh, maturity of the Costa Rican electorate to vote for somebody even though they, they don't know if that person is going to win, which is, you know, in times of um, information, fake news, Etc. It's it's a very very important and very powerful statement to vote against uh, against all odds, right? And talk to us about what can we expect um, in terms of the international and domestic policies of the president elect. Well, uh, in terms of the domestic and international policies, there's going to be continuity. Uh, one of the biggest uh, achievements that that we hope to see materialized with these with this with this new administration is uh, same-sex marriage. That has been by far the main issue of these elections. Um, it, it, will, it, it will become a reality. Um, I don't know how soon in time, but it must happen uh, within the first year of, of, of Carlos Alvarado's new government. Uh, and in terms of international policy, he has already announced that he's going to oppose, for example, the Pacific Alliance trade agreement. He's going to uh, try to not uh, not promote these free trade agreements, which have been devastating for Costa Rican agriculture and for Costa Rican industry. Um, in terms of uh, more domestic issues, there is still a big, big, big problem, which will be what will happen with the, the evangelical movement or this evangelical party that, that was actually running against him for this next four years. Um, they are now in, in Congress, they are now one of the largest political forces. So uh, we have right now a new Congress, which is going to be completely tilted to the right and the far right. And this is going to be a big, um, a big obstacle for anything that the current, well, the new administration will, will try to do. Thank they have divergent, uh, completely divergent uh, agenda. And this, so it, it will be definitely a big challenge. Yes, we, um, I, I tend to see that. Thank you so much for talking to us, um, Gustavo Fuchs. We appreciate your insight. We've been talking to Gustavo Fuchs. He's a, an independent journalist speaking to us from San Jose. Other news now. The two Ecuadorian journalists and their driver who were kidnapped in the Esmeraldas province near the Colombian border last Monday are safe, according to this country's interior minister. Cesar Navas told the media that they are well and that the situation was stable. Now, this news came ahead of a meeting with the family members of the victim. The team of a photographer, writer, and driver from the El Comercio newspaper were kidnapped by a still undisclosed group while covering the living conditions of the inhabitants inhabitants affected by the recent bombings in the region. And two more social leaders were killed in Colombia on Sunday, bringing the death toll to 214 since the beginning of 2017. Human rights defender Belisario Benevides Ordonez was gunned down in Corca in the south of the country, while Maria Magdalena Cruz Rojas, a Colombian land activist, was murdered in Mapiripen in central Colombia. Ordonios, who is remembered for organizing commemorations for the International Day of Victims, was shot four times in front of his three-year-old son and his 12-year-old nephew, 
while Cruz Rojas was killed on her farm in front of her husband and son by armed men in hoods. The former Guatemalan dictator Efren Rios Montt, who led the country from 1982 to 1983, has died. He was 91. Rios Montt came to public office through a coup d'etat and presided over one of the bloodiest periods in Guatemala's civil war as soldiers waged a brutal campaign to root out Marxist guerrillas. Rios Montt was convicted in 2013 of genocide and crimes against humanity for the massacre, rape and torture of more than 1,700 indigen indigenous Ixnil Mayans under a scorched earth policy implemented by security forces under his command. And following the death of the dictator Efren Rios Mott, social movement and human rights activists in Guatemala took to the streets to demand for justice. We have to remember that Efren Rios Mott was convicted of a genocide before he died. The ruling was overturned, but only due to a technical issue. And let's remember, a retrial was underway. We regret that he didn't do the time of the sentence, which was of 80 years. We also regret that he left before the completion of other historic trials, like the death of 200 campesinos, and of course, his responsibility in the disappearance of thousands of people in urban centers across the country. Now that story took us to the break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Mexico's presidential hopefuls have opened the official campaign period with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, or popularly known as AMLO, as the front runner. The campaign will last three months. More than 88 million people are eligible to vote on the election on July 1st. AMLO is the main candidate of the left, running on a nationalist and anti-corruption platform with the slogan, Peace and Love. And the other candidates are also presenting their main campaign promises to the public. Our correspondent, Pablo Perez, from Mexico, tells us more. Even if the campaign period started on Friday night, two of the main contestants held their first rally on Sunday. They say it was to respect the holidays in a very religious country. Uh, Jose Antonio Meade from the ruling Revolutionary Institutional Party held his first rally in Merida, Yucatan, in the southern province of the South Yucatan Peninsula, where he presented his seven-point plan for his presidency, uh, is uh, highlighting points such as the participation of women and the uh, promising that he will get rid of corruption, which is something important because he, the party he's representing, a party he does not belong to, uh, has been accused several times of using state funds to fund uh, the campaigns that he... that. Uh, have been happening the la during the last years, an accusation that has six governors in jail right now and nine under um, investigation, all belonging, all belonging to the Revolutionary Institutional Party. On the other hand, Andres Manuel López Obrador from the uh, uh, National Renew Movement held his first rally in Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, border town in the border with 
the United States. That once a prosperous town and one uh, now holding one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. Andres Manuel blames that uh, to the application of uh, neoliberal policies. And also he promised that he is gonna support the uh, farmers and the agricultural production in Mexico to get to an uh, alimentary self-sufficiency, which he says is, uh, uh, in, is, is fundamental for his project of uh, a country here in Mexico. So there was, there, there were the two uh, of the two of the three main contestants uh, starting their campaign. We still have three more months to go until the election on July 1st. We thank Pablo Perez for that report. The U.S. President Donald Trump says the DACA program, which protects young immigrants from deportation, is dead. He is also demanding that Mexico do more to control its border with the United States and has repeated his threat to pull out of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. In a series of tweets early on Monday morning, Trump said, Mexico is making a fortune on NAFTA. They have very strong border laws. Ours are pathetic. Hopefully, they will also stop people from coming through their country and into ours, at least until Congress changes our immigration laws. He also tweeted, DACA is dead because the Democrats didn't care or act, and now everyone gets, wants to get onto the DACA bandwagon. It no longer works. Must build wall and secure our borders with the proper border legislation. So let's go live to Washington and our correspondent, Jorge Hestuso. Jorge, Trump has threatened the DACA program before. What should we make of these latest remarks that it is dead? There is agreement that basically this is a strategy that he's acting out of frustration because he doesn't get the funds to build the wall. To remember that when they organized the budget for the rest of 2018, only the budget was approving $1.6 billion to enhance security, technology for security in the border. He was asking for $25 billion and didn't work. So it was a real slap in her face. Most definitely, out of that frustration, he's threatened and insulting and disqualifying people left and right. We have to be, I would say, careful not to repeat, not to be an echo chamber of what he wants to say, like uh, uh, disqualifying our people in Latin America coming to the States as a result of trade policy of the U.S. That part of the story is not being reported on, on mass media and disqualifying uh, the, the opposition party, in this case the Democrats. We have to be careful not to be an echo chamber of his strategy. His strategy is in order to try to f twist the arm to get funds to build his supposed wall, he's acting in, in this new way, trying to stop the legislation regarding DACA and trying to stop the advanced, eventually advanced, of the negotiation with the NAFTA agreement. And this is exactly what is going on in Washington, started during the weekend uh, when he was at Mar-a-Lago and continued this morning uh, in the White House. Uh, we have to keep an eye to see if that strategy is going to work and if it's going to get something out of it. Thank you so much for that update, um, Jorge Hestoso. That is our Washington co correspondent. The U.S. may start asking visitors to declare their social media history. In an expansion of its screening policy, the State Department is proposing that all visa applicants declare their social media identities for the past five years. That includes details of Facebook and Twitter accounts, as well as email addresses. If passed, the measure will affect almost 15 million people. Every Easter, Venezuelan Catholics burn figures of Judas made of old clothes. The annual tradition symbolizes the triumph of good over evil. This year, they took the effigy of United States President Donald Trump as the representation of evil. The figure was displayed throughout the morning and met its fiery death on the afternoon of Easter Sunday. And many Haitians in Port-au-Prince celebrated Easter with a traditional voodoo ceremony. Easter Sunday marks one of the holiest days of the voodoo calendar. 
Through sacrifices, music, and dance, believers show their devotion to the gods. Voodoo is a fusion of religious beliefs brought from Africa with Catholic elements from the colonial era. The Haitian government first recognized it in the 1960s. And Catholics gathered in the old town of Guatemala to take part in a unique procession to reenact the crucifix crucifixion of Christ. Hundreds dressed up in purple clothes and burnt incense in the south of Guatemala to commemorate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They celebrated Easter with a traditional procession carrying symbols as signs of their love and loyalty. It's a practice that has been alive for more than 400 years. I want to thank God for the gift of life, for having my family all together, for the favors received, and overall, for life. For me, that is the essence of carrying this. With flowers, prayers, and songs, the ceremony is celebrated by both locals and foreigners as a show of faith. The Catholic Holy Week is seen by the community as a celebration of cultural traditions created by the mix of Spanish and Mayan beliefs in the country. In Argentina, veterans and their families have paid homage to the soldiers who lost their lives in the 1982 Malvinas War. On the 36th anniversary of the start of the conflict, they gathered at the Monument to the Fallen in Malvinas in Buenos Aires. 649 Argentinians lost their lives during the two-month war between Argentina and Britain. The War Veterans Association asked the Argentinian government to fund ex-soldiers' pensions, as President Mauricio Macri had promised. Time now for another short break, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Anti-apartheid activist and South African politician Winnie Mandela has died at the age of 81. She was the former wife of the country's first black president, Nelson Mandela. They were married for 38 years, including the 27 years he was imprisoned on Robben Island. They had two children together. Winnie and Nelson Mandela were a symbol of the anti-apartheid struggle for decades, but their marriage failed a few years after his release. Winnie Mandela then became a member of parliament in 1994 after the first democratic elections in South Africa.
He's a commissioner. Now let's look at some other stories making headlines around the world. At least 15 people have been killed in a suspected attack by Boko Haram militants in Maiduguri in northeast of Nigeria on Sunday. Over 80 people have also been wounded in the attack. Maiduguri is the epicenter of a nine-year-long conflict between the Nigerian military and Boko Haram, a conflict that has led to over 20,000 deaths. Ethiopia has sworn in Abiyya Ahmed as its new prime minister. Just after taking office, Ahmed said he would like to resolve the border war with Eritrea that has lasted two years and claimed over 70,000 lives. Ahmed is of Oromo descent, the country's largest ethnic group, and he has been vocal opponent of the government. He will take the reins from Hel Mariam Desalgne, who resigned last month over mass protests. I wish to express our readiness to solve our differences not only for the sake of mutual benefit, but also for the mutual benefit of the people of the two countries who are tied with blood. On this occasion, I would like to call up on the Eritrean government to show a similar stand. The defunct Chinese space station Tiangong-1 has re-entered Earth somewhere over the South Pacific. That's all the detailed space officials have released for now. The space lab disintegrated under intense heat as it hurtled through Earth's atmosphere. The space station, which was 10 meters long and weighed over 8 tons, had been descending since 2016. It was launched in 2011, but the Chinese space scientist had lost contact with the spacecraft. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un attended a South Korean concert for the first time on Sunday. Kim was filmed clapping after popular K-pop singers from the South performed at Grand Theatre in East Pyongyang. The artists are performing in North Korea for the first time in more than a decade, thanks to the thawing relations on the peninsula. And that brings us to the end of this news brief. But for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, Antalasio TV.